Hey everyone and welcome back for another deep dive. Today we are heading over to the beautiful waters of Bali, Indonesia to explore the work of Lou Corner Marine Research. These folks are doing some seriously impressive work in the field of coral reef restoration. And as you probably know, coral reefs, these vibrant underwater cities teeming with life, they're facing an uphill battle against climate change and all sorts of human impacts. Yeah, it's a tough situation for sure. And sadly, a lot of these damaged reefs end up as just fields of rubble, mm -hmm. kind of like an underwater desert, not exactly the vibrant ecosystem we're used to picturing. Right, and that's a huge problem because all that loose rubble makes it really tough for new corals to settle and grow. It's like trying to build a house on a foundation of, well, loose rubble. Right. It's going to hold up for very long. Exactly. You need stability, a solid base, before you can even think about restoring a thriving coral community. And that's one of the key things Blue Corner is tackling, stabilizing that rubble to give those reefs a fighting chance. So they're basically like the underwater construction crew laying the foundation for a coral comeback. I like that analogy. And they're using some pretty innovative techniques to do it. Okay, so spill the beans. What's their secret weapon? What are they using to rebuild these reefs? Well, it's not one single thing, but a whole bunch of different methods they're experimenting with. And one that's had some great success is something that sounds surprisingly simple. Metal wire mesh. Wait, mesh? Like the stuff you'd see in a garden fence? Yep, pretty much. It's really effective, though. They lay this mesh down over the rubble, and it acts like a net, trapping all those loose pieces together. So it's not like the mesh itself is some magical reef-building material but it's kind of like creating a framework, holding everything together. Exactly. And what's really cool is that it allows these natural binding organisms to take hold. Natural binders, huh? Yeah. What are we talking about here? Things like sponges and coralline algae. These guys produce calcium carbonate, which basically acts like a cement, binding all that rubble together and creating a solid base for a new coral to settle and grow on. Wow, so it's like they're giving the reef a helping hand, but ultimately it's the reef itself doing the heavy lifting. I like that. Yeah, it's a really neat approach, and the results they've seen are really promising. One of their test plots, just a small area, showed a big reduction in erosion after only a year, and they even started to see signs of a whole new ecosystem developing in that area. That's incredible. Simple but effective. So mesh is one tool in the restoration toolbox, but I'm guessing it's not the only one. What else are they using to rebuild these underwater cities? They're also working with these really cool rebar frames. Rebar, like the steel bars they use in construction. I'm picturing underwater skyscrapers for fish now. Uh-huh. Not quite skyscrapers, but they're definitely creating these structured habitats with rebar. These frames are A-shaped, and the design is pretty clever. The peaked shape helps to create some topographical relief, kind of mimicking the natural contours of a healthy reef. So it's not just chucking some rebar into the ocean and calling it a day. There's some serious thought going into the shape and how they're placing these things. For sure. And each corner of these frames is actually anchored to the seabed. So they're super stable, even in strong currents. And the whole design is this open grid, which allows water to flow through, you know, just like in a natural reef. So it's like they're building these little islands of stability in a sea of rubble. Yeah. Giving coral a place to latch on and start growing again. Exactly. And they've even experimented with coating the frames with epoxy and sand to encourage even more coral attachment. That's cool. Making those frames even more inviting for coral. Yeah. So we've got these rebar frames and they're strategically placed. But tell me, how exactly does Blue Corner go about deploying these things? Where do they put them and why? Well, one of the things they found is that spacing the frames about a meter apart in this grid pattern is actually more efficient for coral coverage than just placing them randomly. Really? I would have thought spreading them out would be better, you know, giving more corals a chance. Why would a grid be better? It's all about controlling how the rubble moves. If the frames are closer together, they act like a series of interconnected barriers, stopping the rubble from shifting around so much. Ah, so it's all about that stability again, making a nice, calm environment for those delicate coral polyps to settle and grow. Exactly. But there's a catch, too. While that grid pattern is great for quick coral coverage, they've also found that if you place frames randomly over a longer period, you end up with what we call greater habitat heterogeneity. Hold on. Heterogeneity. That's a mouthful. Can you break that down for us? Sure. It basically means a more diverse reef structure. If you have frames that were placed at different times, you get this mix of corals at different ages and stages of growth, which ultimately leads to a more complex and natural looking reef. 
Interesting. So it's almost like a trade-off. You can go for speed with the grid and get that quick coral coverage, or you can go for a more diverse, natural-looking reef with the random placement. Makes me wonder if there's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. That's a great question and something researchers are always trying to figure out. Remember, there's no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to reef restoration. That's what makes it so fascinating. Speaking of diverse approaches, I hear Blue Corner has another trick up their sleeve. Something called coral ropes. What are those all about? Basically, they grow young corals on these ropes just above the seafloor, and they often string them between those rebar frames. It's a really cool way to boost coral coverage even more and create this kind of terraced effect. So they're literally farming coral on ropes and then using those ropes to kind of weave together these rebar structures. You got it. It's like creating an underwater hanging garden, and it really encourages those corals to grow vertically. That's awesome. I love how Blue Corner is combining all these different methods, kind of like piecing together a puzzle to rebuild these incredible underwater landscapes. Yeah, it really highlights how dynamic and innovative this whole field of coral reef restoration is. It's all about constantly experimenting and adapting to figure out what works best in each unique environment. It's not just about sticking coral back on a reef. It's about setting the stage for it to thrive in the long run, working with nature to rebuild these ecosystems. Exactly. And that's what makes the work of organizations like Blue Corner so important. They're not just restoring coral reefs. They're giving us hope for the future of our oceans. I'm already hooked. <sighs> but before we get carried away with all this coral optimism, let's get into some specifics about how Blue Corner puts these techniques into practice. What kind of results are they seeing? And what are some of the challenges they've bumped into along the way? And another thing Blue Corner really focuses on is how they position those rebar frames on the reef. It's not just spacing, but the orientation that makes a big difference, too. Okay, so paint me a picture here. We've got our sloping reef underwater. Where are we putting these frames for the best results? Well, let's say you put them perpendicular to the slope, you know, like standing upright. You might think that makes sense, but when all that loose rubble starts tumbling down, what happens? Oh, I see what you mean. Those frames would just get buried under a landslide of coral skeletons. Not very helpful. Right. But if you place the frames parallel to the slope, kind of running along the contours, it's like they act as a dam, you know, trapping all that rubble on the uphill side. And that not only keeps the frames from getting buried, but it also creates a more stable base on the downhill side for the coral to grow on. Exactly. It's like building terraces on a hillside to prevent erosion, but we're doing it underwater. It's amazing how much thought goes into every little detail of these restoration projects. Absolutely. And it just shows how much observation goes into this work, you know. It's not just about throwing any old solution at the problem. It's about really understanding the environment and tailoring the approach to fit. That's what makes this whole field so fascinating. So we've got our metal frames. They're strategically placed, maybe even some coral rope strung between them. But what's the bottom line? How are the reefs actually responding to all these efforts? Well, the results have been really encouraging so far. Blue Corners documented some really positive outcomes from their work stabilizing that rubble. Give me the highlights. What's working? How are those reefs bouncing back? First off, they've seen a huge reduction in how much that rubble is moving around, which is really the foundation for everything else. Makes sense. You got to get that foundation stable before you can start rebuilding. Right. And once the rubble is stabilized, those natural binders we talked about, like the sponges and coralline algae, they can really get to work. It's like the reef is stitching itself back together using those natural building blocks. That's a great way to put it. Right. And as that happens, you start to see more and more new coral larva settling on that stabilized rubble, even on the frames themselves. Wow. So it's incredible how these pretty basic structures can actually kickstart that whole recovery process. Yeah. I do have to wonder, though, are there any downsides to these methods? Like, is there any risk to introducing metal into these delicate ecosystems? That's definitely a valid question. And like any time we intervene in nature, there are things to consider. Introducing foreign materials is always something to think about. Right. Some people might worry about metal structures disrupting the balance of things in the ocean. Yeah. And Blue Corn is very aware of that. That's why they use marine grade epoxy coatings on those rebar frames to prevent corrosion and make sure nothing harmful leaches out into the water. So they're really trying to minimize any negative impact on the environment. That makes sense. What about longevity? How long will these structures actually last before they need to be replaced or taken out? Well, it depends. The type of metal, the conditions in that specific spot, all those things play a role. Some structures might be good for several years, while others might break down faster. So it's not necessarily a permanent fix, but 
it buys the reef some valuable time to recover and hopefully get to a point where it can take care of itself. Exactly. It's about giving those natural processes a chance to take over. And sometimes the structures even become part of the reef itself with coral growing all over and around them. Now that's a happy ending I can get behind. The reef just reclaims those structures and makes them its own. It really shows how resilient nature can be. It really does. Let's go back to those metal wire mesh plots for a second. We touched on them earlier, but I'm curious to know more about how well they work and if there are any specific situations where mesh is a better choice than frames. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Is there a time and place for each method? Well, mesh seems to work best in areas where the slope isn't too steep and there's not a lot of intense wave action. Why is that? What makes those calmer environments better suited for the mesh? Well, think about it. On a steep slope, there's a much higher chance of that mesh getting buried under a ton of shifting rubble. Ah, that makes sense. It's more delicate than those rebar frames. Exactly. And if there are strong currents, that mesh might not be strong enough to hold up. It could get ripped away. Okay, so it's kind of a more delicate solution, best for calmer areas. Yeah. But you said earlier that they saw some impressive results even in that small test plot, right? Oh, yeah. After only a year, that little mesh plot was able to reduce erosion significantly and trap enough rubble for those binding organisms to start doing their thing. They even saw soft corals, sponges, and coralline algae starting to colonize the area. That's amazing. Even small-scale efforts can really make a difference. And it brings up something we haven't really touched on yet, the human side of all this. You're right. We can't forget about that. Successful reef restoration isn't just about science, it's about people, too. Community involvement is a huge part of it. Absolutely. It takes a village, or in this case, a whole community of dedicated people, to make a real lasting impact. So how does Blue Corner bring those local communities into the mix? How are they involved? They're actually involved in every step of the process. Blue Corner provides training and education to the local communities, empowering them to become stewards of their own reefs. So it's not just scientists coming in and doing the work. It's about giving those communities the knowledge and tools to be a part of the solution. Exactly. And when people feel like they're part of something, they're more likely to take ownership and protect those reefs for the long haul. That makes a lot of sense. It's really inspiring to see how Blue Corner is combining science with community engagement. It's such a powerful combination. We've covered a lot of ground today, but I want to take a step back for a minute and think big picture. From everything Blue Corner's learned so far, what would you say are some of the key takeaways for anyone who's interested in coral reef restoration, whether they're a scientist, a policymaker, or just someone who cares about the ocean? That's a great question. I think one of the biggest takeaways is that there isn't one simple answer. You know, there's no magic bullet that's going to work for every reef. So you can't just copy and paste solutions from one place to another. Each reef is unique. Exactly. And that's why it's so important to really observe, monitor, and do research. You have to constantly be checking what's working, what's not, and be willing to adapt your methods as you go. It's about being flexible, just like the ocean itself. Exactly. And another crucial thing is addressing those root causes of why reefs are declining in the first place. Right. You can't just focus on repairing the damage. You got to tackle those underlying issues. For sure. Things like climate change, pollution, overfishing, all those things need to be addressed if we want to see healthy reefs in the future. It's a good reminder that restoration is just one piece of the puzzle. <laughs> it has to be part of a much bigger strategy to protect the oceans. And last but not least, and maybe most important, is to remember that there is still hope. Yeah, that's so crucial. It's easy to feel overwhelmed when you think about all the challenges facing coral reefs. It's true, but the work of organizations like Blue Corner shows us that we can make a difference. It's about innovation, collaboration, a willingness to learn, and a genuine commitment to finding solutions. It's about remembering that even small actions, when a lot of people do them, can have a big impact. Yeah, and that's what makes me hopeful for the future, you know? Seeing these organizations like Blue Corner out there coming up with new ideas and seeing how resilient those reefs can be. It's like that saying, think globally, act locally. We need big solutions for those big problems like climate change, but we also need those on the ground or I guess in the water efforts like what Blue Corner is doing. It's a great example of how research can be translated into real action. And they're always learning, you know, always evaluating their methods, figuring out what works best. Speaking of what works best, we've talked about all these different techniques, mesh, frames, those coral ropes. Does Blue Corner have a favorite method or is it more about choosing the right tool for the job depending on the reef they're working with. 
It's definitely about picking the best approach for each specific site, yeah. They realize that every technique has its pluses and minuses. So it's like being a coral reef doctor. You wouldn't give the same treatment to every patient. That's a perfect analogy. You gotta figure out what the problem is and then decide what's gonna be most effective. Like if you're working in an area with strong currents and a steep slope, those A-frames are probably your best bet because they can handle those forces and provide that stability. But if it's a calmer area, maybe with a gentler slope, then the mesh might be the way to go. Right, and they often combine methods too, you know, like maybe use mesh to stabilize a big area and then put some A-frames in there to add some more structure. And then weave it all together with those coral ropes. They're basically creating these multi-layered underwater gardens. And they're thinking about the whole ecosystem, not just coral. You know, the fish, the invertebrates, all the creatures that call the reef home. And those local communities we talked about, they probably play a big part in keeping those gardens healthy, right? Absolutely. Blue Corner works with them to monitor those restored areas, keep them clean, and basically act as guardians of the reef. It's like this amazing cycle where restoration leads to stewardship, and those reefs become something the community takes pride in and protects. Yeah, it's a powerful reminder that we're all connected to the ocean, even if we don't live right on the coast. The things we do, the choices we make, they all have an impact. So what can our listeners do, even if they're not a marine biologist or live near the ocean? What are some ways they can help be part of the solution? There's a lot you can do. Reducing your carbon footprint, being mindful of the seafood you eat, supporting organizations like Blue Corner, those are all great places to start. And don't forget about the power of just talking about it, you know? Spreading the word about coral reefs and why they're important. The more people who know and care, the better. For sure, collective action is what we need. We need to remember that these ecosystems aren't just pretty to look at, they're vital for the health of our planet and for people too. The story of Blue Corner Marine Research really highlights that, you know? It's a story of human ingenuity, collaboration, and hope for the future. We've shown you how they're approaching this challenge, but we want to leave you with something to think about. If you were in charge of restoring a coral reef, what else would you consider? What kind of unique solutions could you come up with? That's something to ponder, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep those deep dives going. Thanks for joining us today.